Um, is there someone who wants to umze who hasn't done it before or hasn't done it recently? <laughs> Don't worry, Autumn. It's not going to be you. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> not <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to volunteer. <laughs> All right. Karen, do you want to do Umsday today? <laughs> okay, that face sold a lot, so that's okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> I can't. I just have to go get my mala. <laughs> okay. I'll be right back. All right, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> get off. Off the <laughs> So, um, if everyone wants to mute themselves except for Karen, we can go ahead and get started with prayers. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one. <coughs> Excuse me. Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds. Supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, 
endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create, by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, may I attain Buddhahood, for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion Please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Gudaradna Mandala Kamniyate Ami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on Mass of Vultures Mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Sharputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. 
How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharabhali Putra. Sharaputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Sharputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata, gate, gate, par gate, par sam gate bodhisoha. Tayata gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva and mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva and mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shardvati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Um, Autumn? 
All right. I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see everybody's faces and icons. Um, I want to also acknowledge that I have family members here, um, some that are of other traditions. So welcome and thank you for joining us uh, to my dad and Daniel and also, um, you know, my husband and maybe my kids are here somewhere um, listening in. So Lama asked me to speak today about how the Dharma fits into my life, which is actually a uh, really big topic for me. And it's also very personal. So um, I just want to preface this by saying um, I really consider myself a beginner. Um, I've been a, a student of Lama Jimpa's for a couple years now, but I feel like I'm just now starting to scratch the surface. So, you know, I may make mistakes in some of, some of my references or whatever it may be, but my hope is that um, though I don't have it all figured out, that by sharing some of my discoveries that perhaps it may benefit, be of benefit to those who are listening today. So who am I? A lot of you know me, some of you don't. So um, I've got a really busy life right now. First of all, I'm a mother. I have two small children who I love dearly, a six-year-old and an 11-month-old. And uh, anybody who's been a parent knows that that first year with an infant is some of the busiest times that you'll have in your entire life. Um, I am also running a business, which I started a little over a year ago. Um, I'm a wife. I'm a student of Lama Jimpa's. I'm an educator. And to say my life is busy is kind of an understatement. My husband and I uh, plan our days out by the hour. Um, also throw in the pandemic and the fact that we can't bring in outside childcare. Um, it's just ridiculous. Plus we're doing, um, you know, distance education for my daughter. So it's just like, it's crazy. So, you know, do I have time for Dharma? Um, you know, I've asked myself that sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I have time. I don't have time to meditate or whatnot. Um, I certainly can't make it to all the events that I would like to make it to. But lately, as I've gone deeper into the practice, I feel more like I don't have the time not to have the Dharma in my life. Because um, as you go deeper into the Dharma, you start to realize that um, working with your mind and these things that are troubling you really frees you up. Uh, mentally and emotionally to be able to handle more and have more space for more things that are in your life. So um, the first thing I want to talk about when you're dealing with a busy life is um, something that Lama says and other therapists at Middle Way Health say a lot, and that's to meet yourself where you are. So the first year with an infant, you're very exhausted all the time. Um, so I had to come up with more creative ways um, to keep the Dharma at the top of my mind. So it's going to this concept of familiarization. So um, what are some ways that you can bring Dharma into your life that maybe aren't, um, you know, traditional sitting there meditating for hours and hours? Um, so here's a few things that I did, and I would love to hear um, at the end of the talk, maybe some ideas that you guys have for me that I could try. Um, but I found that bringing, uh, Dharma into my family life has helped like bringing the medicine Buddha in when my children are sick, you know, to, to give them that energy. They really enjoy that. I enjoy that. Um, sometimes bringing in some, um, like the Mixtema prayers in the like song form and, and having those play where my daughter can hear them is really nice. Um, Sometimes if I don't, if I have to rush out the door to do an assignment, I may end up reciting prayers on my way to the assignment while driving because I missed my meditation, quite honestly, but that keeps it at the top of mind. Um, and reading, this is, this is kind of funny. This is my own creative way of getting Dharma reading in when I'm exhausted. I started reading this book. It's called What Would Buddha Do? <laughs> It, it's really funny because I had a coworker who used to say, um, 
what would Jesus do every time we had a, a problem? <laughs> and so when I saw that title, I thought, I'm going to pick up this book and it, cause it kind of made me chuckle. And um, it's like these really simple, like one minute readings that I would read. So I'd be tired. My mind would be completely mush and I could just pick it up and read one page and that would plant some, some seeds in my mind to keep going with throughout the day. And then taking care of yourself. I remember in a darshan um, with Lama, I asked him like, sometimes I get to the end of the day and I haven't meditated and I'm exhausted. I can't uh, think straight. I, I mean, should I just be disciplined and meditate or should I go to sleep? <laughs> He's like, go to sleep, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so actually I learned a lot from that because I'm a very, um, I tend to push myself very hard and he, kind of taught me with that to, it's not about that um getting your meditation in so to speak is not about pushing yourself hard it's it's about nurturing yourself and if nurturing yourself means that you need to go to bed then go to bed and um so that's what i would do and i also read in what would buddha do uh one thing where uh i think it was the buddha who said um there's nothing more spiritual than eating a sesame flatbread when you're hungry. So um, taking care of yourself and those little things. Um, I used to always just push, 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 push myself. And now I'm taking care of myself better. And doing that has really freed me up um, mentally and spiritually in my life. And of course, having a good teacher, going to Dar Darshan regularly, um, that also has really helped. So I know I can't make it to all the events, but I'd love to see all your beautiful faces, but there's a time when I will be more free and available for um, those types of meetings. And I look forward to that. So next I'm gonna tell you uh, a few stories in my life um, that are hopefully of benefit. And they're going back to three Lojong slogan. So most of you who are Lama students have probably read Training the Mind. And uh, it's about uh, mind training. And this is also a good book for, for anybody who's not a Buddhist. The, the Dharma is very practical, right? It's, it's like, give you very practical things to use in your life. And you don't have to be a Buddhist to um, take advantage of that. And I found, you guys may have found this too, that as you read these texts, like sometimes some of it will come into your, uh, your mind and be a part of your life and others will be kind of on the back burner. And then those ones might bubble up into your life at some other point of time and the other ones recede. And so they, it's kind of like a breathing text and direction. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is point three is using unfavorable circumstances as aids to awakening. And so this first story is about the story of struggling with two children. <laughs> so when I had one child, I could fairly easily convince myself that I had my life under control and that I was a good parent. You know, my daughter was pretty easygoing. She was a really uh, fun baby. And I was like, yeah, I got this thing like figured out, right? my life's in control like i i can do this I had my second child and he is a fireball and he cried constantly he was colicky he was um i just adore him so much but he was um attached to me 24 7 for four months he didn't want to have much to do with anybody else so um it very quickly became in our household a situation where nobody's needs were being met. My daughter wasn't getting the attention she needed. Um, my husband and I forget about it. Like our needs are way on the back burner. My son, he's got all the attention, but he's for some reason having a fit all the time. So I struggled really hard. There was some really dark times in my family and I, I felt like a really bad parent but because of all this training and just kind of llama very gently guiding me into um being more compassionate towards myself something different happened um, my old pattern pre 
dharma would have been to attack myself, say, you're a bad parent, you're not doing it right. Um, and this time, um, there was this one moment in particularly where my two children were both crying and I'm sitting there like losing my mind and my mother is there trying to help me out. And I looked at her and I just felt this overwhelming sense of compassion for her and what she went through raising two children on her own because she was also a single parent. I've got support. She was a single parent with two young children and I think as an adult child, I have judged my parents quite a bit, you know, for what I perceived as their mistakes. And in that moment, instead of going on the attack, what I did wrong, what my kids did wrong, what my parents did wrong, I just felt like this real softening and this real compassion of joining my mother in her difficulties and understanding that I have good intentions for my children. I love them deeply. My mother loved us deeply. I make mistakes, she made mistakes. And you know what, we're all gonna be okay. And so I just felt this big opening happening. And the really neat thing about that is instead of like my previous pattern of going on the attack uh, closes you up. But when you even when you're struggling and making mistakes, if you have that opening sense of compassion, that frees you up to go like, okay, well, what can I do to meet my kids' needs better? So then you can, because you're not tied up in your own uh, mode of attack, you can then be a better parent, you know, instead of saying, you be a better parent. <laughs> it's just like saying, okay, we're all struggling, we're all doing our best, and, and uh, you know, I just hope that one day my children will see me with the same level of clarity that I just saw my mother. And uh, hopefully they will and just know that I love them so much, even though I make mistakes. So had I not had two children, had I not had one child, I don't think I would have gotten to the other side of that thing with my own parents. So um, that's how struggling can lead you into something better. So that was the first story I wanted to tell you. The next story is, and I didn't tell my husband that I was going to talk about that, but it's about you, honey, if you're over there. <laughs> so the next slogan is called uh, drive all blames into one. You guys may have heard this and it means um, taking the blame onto yourself. So and I love that one of the texts says, calls the blame the paper tiger or the hot potato. So nobody wants the blame. It's a hot potato. You're trying to pass the blame. You take it. No, you take it. Nobody wants the blame because it's this hot thing and you think it's going to burn you. But guess what? If you actually take the blame, it's a paper tiger. It can't hurt you. In fact, once you take the blame, then you can begin to have conversations and actually get somewhere. So one morning, uh, our son got up an hour early. You'll see a lot of our struggles revolve around lack of sleep. <laughs> so anyway, uh, my son got up an hour earlier and I was tired and I went on the attack because I was exhausted and I attacked my husband and I started an argument. And anybody who's been in a long-term relationship will know how these things go. If you've been in a, with a partner for a long time, your arguments tend to take a certain direction and it tends to be the same direction every time. So we've been together for 14 years and it just like <laughs> did its thing. So we're in this big argument and I'm like, okay, I gotta go. So I go into my office and I meditate, I cry. I, I'm like, okay, I've done all this study and I'm still like majorly messing up. But now here's where the rubber hits the road. This is where like, you're going to have to make some changes in your life. And there's this painful spot, which is this argument. And you know what you need to do. And you're going to have to change your behavior. <laughs> you're going to have to do something different. And so I did. Like, it was really, really hard. I was so scared of taking that blame on. But I did. Like, I invited it in. The first thing I did, I, I called him into my office. Come to my office, honey. <laughs> I called him to my office 
I offered him a chair. Would you like to sit down? He's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, would you like some snacks? <laughs> and I had some, I had some cheese and crack. Would you like some, you know, like it shouldn't be so hard to serve your husband, but okay, I did. I, I offered it and then I just sat down and I said, I'm sorry, it's my fault. That's it. And I could see my mind originally was like, but you, but you know, like you can't, you want to keep, you always want to say, I'm sorry, but right. But no, I just, I'm sorry, my fault. That's it. And he's like, whoa. <laughs> and you know, it, everything went great from there and it felt really good. And you know, it actually wasn't that scary. It, it turned out great and it was a wonderful, um, uh, it just melted everything. We came out hugging and, and reunited and that worked out really well. So the thing with these insights though, and Lama's talked about this before, you have insights, right? You see something, you have a felt sense of something that works, but you have to keep doing it. You don't just have the insight and that's it. Your life has changed. You have to keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And that's where training versus practice comes in. So this is all training that we do, the meditation, the slogans, the prayers, and then the practice is putting it into practice into your life. So I put it into practice once. It worked out great. Guess what? I've got the rest of my life to keep practicing the same thing. So I got to keep doing it. And the next one I want to talk about is uh, slogan number two, consider the world as dreamlike. And I, I don't know how many people can relate to this one or not, but um, it's about kind of grasping and rejecting. And um, I have a problem with that with my kids because I love the infant stage. I just love that mother infant bond. And it's just something so unique and so special. And it's really, really, really hard when that's over. So when my kids turn one years old, like I grieve and I grieve hard because they're no longer my little babies anymore. And it seems selfish to say that because it's a blessing that they're healthy and they're growing, but it's hard for me to say goodbye to that. So I'm grasping, like I'm grasping at this little baby and I want to keep it for myself and I can't because they just keep on growing. And then I reject their bad behaviors and I reject or things I perceive as a bad behavior is I reject those moments when there's conflict and, and I don't like this stage. I don't like what they're doing. I have to change it. You know, like, how do I get out of this? You know, uh, so I'm constantly like grabbing for the good times and pushing away the bad times with my kids. And, and it's really painful. And that's, that's what they mean by this um, creating suffering because you're constantly like, I want to hold on and I want to push away. And uh, so I think realizing impermanence as it relates to my children has been helpful. And seeing these moments now as these dreams, as these um, beautiful inter interdependent co-arising that occurs, right? Like we've created these children and it's just this little moment in time. It's sort of like watching a movie or a river wash by. Um, I try to keep that at the top of my mind at the beautiful moments when my children are in my arms is, you know, to just see that beautiful moment. And even if they're having a hard time um, and arguing, maybe like, that's, that's just a moment in time and not trying to reject that moment, but just seeing it for what it is. So that's also been a big uh, blessing in my life is to start seeing that. But again, you know, these are little insights that I have the Dharma to thank for and, and Lama's amazing guidance, but we have to keep putting it into practice. Um, and that's what practice means, right? So my life, it's hard to find time for training, but there's easy easy to find time to practice <laughs> every day <laughs> practice every day all day so um you keep practicing it eventually becomes a realization and you keep practicing it and eventually becomes your truth and maybe i won't be attacking my husband in the morning at all anymore so that's that's my presentation
I hope there was some helpful things in that. Um, but to end, you know, of course, there's time for questions. But if you have any stories to share in your own life of how um, challenges have helped you lead to your path, I would love to hear them. Or if you have any little Dharma hacks for incorporating Dharma into your everyday life when you're busy, I would also love to hear that. So let open it up. Thank you. I saw a clap. I didn't hear it, but I saw it. So thank you. <laughs> Maybe I'll look in the chat. Oh, no chat. Okay. This is, this is Dad, so uh, <laughs> you already kind of introduced me. Thank you, and I've, I've loved your precept. People could just unmute themselves and, and say something if they wanted to, Autumn. Oh, yeah, my, my dad was talking. Okay. Anyway, so this, what's Dharma? <laughs> I guess oh, I'm sorry. Question. Dharma is uh, the teachings, basically. So similar to... Um, like the Bible. Does someone else want to answer that? This is a good question for Lama. Dharma is the teachings. Is that, am, I, am I right? Yeah, you're right. Okay. If somebody has a better way of saying that. Well, it's also you, right? You were talking about see all things as a dream. You know, it's not just the teachings. It's the view. It's, it's the mindset, mm -hmm. which comes from the teachings, but also from practice and, and all that. So, yeah. So it's pretty broad. Yeah. So it's kind of like your paradigm or something is what it sounds like to me, or the, the lens that you're seeing things through and your, how you see yourself in, in the midst of everything. Is that? I think a, a correlation may be the gospel, perhaps. In, our termino in the terminology I'm used to. Okay. Maybe like the gospel, like the teachings, the, yeah. That would be the closest thing and uh, that I can see. Thank you. That's that's helpful. I appreciate that. Love you. Thanks. Thanks for coming. So somebody's got to have a story to tell. Dharma story. I, I didn't. I didn't use up my whole time. So you guys have to make up for it. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Autumn. It's Elizabeth. Hello. Hi. Um, so I just thought I would weigh in and really kind of just echo what you just said, you know, about fitting everything in. And I talked to Lama about this a lot. Um, you're, you're doing the work and we're doing the work and that's the most important thing. Um, the practice is the practice, you know, and the fruits of the practice is the is actually doing it. And I think that the more that we recognize the doing part of it, the more we recognize that the practice, that the, the training is working. And so um, I feel like for me, you know, I can tell that when I've been doing, you know, consistent with my meditation and, you know, doing the practice, it comes out in different ways. Like, um, just the way I respond. And, you know, just like you said, just the way you respond to a different situation and maybe putting a gap in the way that you um, think about things. So is there, it's like adding a pause is how I kind of, how I kind of describe it to people. And it's a mindful pause where you, you choose your, your reaction instead of just reacting. And that is a powerful one. That's a really important one, especially, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's hard to do that. Um, so that's just kind of my, my two cents and kind of the same, you know, echoing what you just said, it's just reminding yourself that that is the most important piece of it. So thank you. Your talk was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, Lama and I have talked a lot about this too. We have different metaphors. I'll throw a metaphor out there that the training or the meditation is, is your tool it's not the goal itself. The goal is the practice, which is how you put it into your life. So it's like saying the hammer is the goal. No, the hammer is not the goal. It's what you're building with the hammer. That's the goal. <laughs> so um, keeping that in mind, then maybe there's multiple ways to 
uh, use that tool or maybe there's multiple tools that you can employ to make that building um, and they're going to look different uh, at different times in your life so you know I've changed my meditation time you know for a while it was in the morning because that's when I could focus the best and then for a while it was in the evening because then everybody was in bed and then that wasn't working because I was too tired and then you know, I may have the altar in the living room with the kids. And then I'm like, no, that's not where that's going in the, I mean, you just got to keep working with it. If things aren't working, it, it's, it's going to continue to evolve, you know? Um, but yeah, the, the goal of Buddhism is not to spend all day meditating. I, I don't think it's just to meditate as much as you need in order to make the, the practice work. Hey, Autumn. Uh, this is Karen. Thank you for your talk. I I can relate to you because I have three children myself. Um, however, they're all adults now. My youngest is 21. Um, but I remember trying to do my Dharma practice in a household with three kids and a husband who didn't have a Dharma practice. And so um, you know, had had a minimal one, you know, and so I really had a lot of challenge trying to do, I was doing some um, sutra and tantra practices. I was really a challenge to figure out how to fit that in. And you were just saying that, well, you had it in the morning and then you had it in this. I at one point had my altar in the closet um, <laughs> <laughs> because it was the only room, place in the house where I can shut the door and not disturb anybody else. And nobody would come in there and disturb me. And it was, so I'm sitting there among all these clothes hanging and everything. And Lama kind of looked at me very funny when I said that, but, but I had actually gotten the idea from another Sangha member who had done the same thing because he didn't want to disturb his partner and, and he wanted a private space. And that was the only place he could find in the house. And so it really is challenging, but these are all temporary conditions and temporary things and you know over time you know things changed and and um now you know that that was many years ago but now um you know i have a whole house to myself i live by myself and i can i have a whole room you know that i have my altar in and and there's nobody uh it coming there to bother me and i can do and sit and do as my many practices as i want you know in a row and so it just kind of like you have to sort of flow with with you know the people who are around you now and the, and your kids at the ages that they are now and they're going to grow up really really fast you'll see um, and and the next thing you know they'll be graduating from high school and they won't want to talk to you about dharma or anything buddha and those you know my youngest son used to make anti buddha jokes you know because he had heard it so much from me he just wanted to revolt and rebel against me. <laughs> and so, um, so I just, you know, it's, it's very, very challenging um, to, to hold on to what you need to support yourself um, and while you have this family who have each have their own, they have their own karma and they have their own path. And so, but you got to remember to hang on to your path and what, what you need to do and, um, like you sounds like you're very creative with that. So um, good, you know, good luck to you with that. Well, thank you. And uh, the closet, now that's that's necessity leading to creativity right there. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I've been keeping that in mind that there's gonna be a time in the not too distant future where, where I'll have plenty of time to meditate, you know. Uh, I don't know. Just got to appreciate what's what's here while it's here because it, everything changes. Um, let's see. Uh, my Jewel, we have a couple chat here. Um, Jewel said, and thank you, Morris, for your comment. Um, and Jules asked, I'm wondering if you could elaborate more on how your relationship with yourself has changed since you began practicing. It seems like you and others have learned to become much kinder to yourself, which is so important. Um, 
you know, uh, Lama ha has called it a recovering perfectionist, he's called himself. <laughs> I definitely fall into that category. I'm not sure if I'm even recovering, but I'm, I'm, attempt I'm aspiring to recover as a perfectionist, but I've been very hard on myself uh, my entire life. And I guess what it's come down to is that the first, you know, the beginnings of the, the practice for me were about compassion, right? I mean, that's one of the cornerstones of Buddhism is to have compassion. And um, somewhere along the line, it was made pretty clear that that includes you. Like you can't have compassion for everyone else and not yourself. Like if you're going on the attack towards yourself, like that's still being on the attack. It, I, I think before I, I would take my anger and I would turn it on myself because I felt like that was the safest thing to do because I wouldn't be causing arguments. I would just attack myself. So it was like I was the place where I would send the anger. And I realized um, just somehow over time with, with Lama and how compassionate he has been towards me and everything else that, that that's still attacking and that's still attacking a sentient being, even if it's myself and that's not okay. So um, I, I've, I guess I've, I've learned that and have, am integrating that into my own life. Um, hope that answers the question. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that when you don't go on the attack, whether it's towards someone else or towards yourself, then that makes you more available to your kids, you know, um, or to anyone else that you're trying to have a relationship with. I mean, honestly, it's, it's like the weirdest thing. I told Lama a couple darshans back. I said, I realized that when I'm tired I should rest <laughs> like it it sounds so obvious and it's maybe obvious to a lot of other people but I live my entire life pushing myself to the max like you're tired push harder and so he was always like never encouraging me to push myself like that he's always like rest you know or if you can't meditate because you're this that just don't you know it, it he was always so compassionate about that whereas I always looked at meditation first of all I never thought I'd be able to meditate in my life like my whole life I never thought I could meditate um because my internal world was so um like horrible <laughs> basically but you know he's he start starts off so gentle in that process and and teaching you how to take care of yourself pretty much and so i've taken that to heart and especially during these times with these kids is like i'll take little micro breaks you know like okay and now i'm just gonna sit down and breathe for a minute <laughs> you know instead of push push go harder go harder it's like no uh take some time so taking care of yourself is important it's just like taking care of anyone else like why do all the other sentient beings get to matter besides myself? Because I'm an easy target to myself, maybe. <laughs> it's not okay. So, yeah. Um, I hope that answers it, Jules. I loved your talk last time, too. Andrea's here. Andrea has been my BFF since uh, 2000. Five. There she is. Everybody say hello. Hi. Yeah, I have so much love for this woman. I yeah. think we go back longer than two thousand five. I want to say two thousand three because it was before I graduated. Yeah, so we're college buddies, and she's amazing. And she um, also knows her uh, dharma. She was actually involved in it way earlier than I was, and I was like, "What is she doing?" This. <laughs> uh, but do you want to say your comment, Ben? Yeah, um, sure. Um, I don't know when you were, I, I think when everyone was kind of talking about, you know, practice and where do I practice and how do I fit it in and in my home and in my time and all of these places. 
it just brought to mind this thing that I, I really think, I think it was Chagam Trumpa Rinpoche who said, you know, and there's no such thing as like a post meditation experience. Um, and I remember like when I was practicing a lot in community, it was like, you know, the gong would ring and you'd just be like running out of the shrine room to like whatever, like snacks or like, for those of us who are smokers at the time, like cigarettes, like get out, oh my God. You know, and it was like, okay, when I'm meditating and that really had this feeling for me of like, when I'm meditating, that's a very separate experience from when I'm not meditating. And like putting that wall around it, because like meditating was a thing I did in community and maybe at home. And so it was just, a teacher brought it up as this like, you know, after noticing that like a lot of us are putting this kind of boundary around meditation and like, it's this thing that only happens when I sit on my cushion. It's this thing that only happens when I'm in community and I'm in a shrine room. And I just really love that. Like, what's your post meditation experience like? And it's kind of like, there really isn't one. Like you are bringing the practice with you like out into the world. Um, and every place can be, your shrine room or your your cushion at home and every place and every experience can like bring you back to um, experiencing the nature of the present moment if you're willing to allow that into your practice. Um, so that kind of really came up for me um, as that discussion was unfolding. Yeah, yeah, she, she asked me, was it last night? You said, how's your talk for your preparation, preparation <laughs> for your talk going? And I, I said, uh, where is this picture? I pulled up a picture. This is a, this is my son. <laughs> my drawer of clothes onto the floor for like the twentieth time in two days. He just uh, takes the clothes, throws them on the floor, I put them back in the drawer. He takes them, throws them on the floor, I put them back in the drawer. This is what we do. And I'm like, that's that's how it's going. <laughs> 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 this is what this is this is life right <laughs> there is no separation right there is no separation it's just that the med that the meditation is your training so i've noticed that if it's really hard for me to hold that image of tara in my brain while i have no distraction sitting in front of my altar with a picture of tara sitting there right in front of me if it's hard for me to keep that image in my brain when she's right in front of me how do i go out into my life and i continue to bring tara into my life you know so that's why it's training. Like if I can sit for six minutes and keep that image stable, then maybe I might have a chance of bringing her into the rest of my life. <laughs> so, yeah. Anybody else have any hacks? When you're really busy, anybody have any hacks to keep it at the top of your mind? You mentioned Lojong. Um, <laughs> One trick that I used to do, and I've actually been thinking about doing it again, is um, I've got a set of cards with each one of the slogans on a separate card. And so in the morning, I'll just shuffle through the deck and pull out a card and stick it up on my counter. And that's the card for the day. That's the thought for the day. And no, just totally random. And, you know, if I need to, I'll pull out, you know, like Training the Mind or one of the other Lojong books, just do a quick read, you know, a paragraph or two about it. But that's just the thought for the day. That's nice. I like that. It's uh, sort of similar to my What Would Buddha Do? <laughs> I, love that. I love that title. Isn't that a great title? Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I have a something yeah. i do uh your picture of your son pulling the stuff out of the drawer i have i have no children but i do have a 91 year old and a, a couple of siamese cats and the siamese cats are um, always are going through the closets pulling things out onto the floor but there's a lot of beating of each other and uh sliding on rugs smashing into walls and um, screaming. And so when I meditate, I just assume that that is a possibility. And um, if something gets out of control, I give myself permission to get up and take care of it. And uh, with the knowledge that when I come back and sit down again, 
and start my timer that usually I have more clarity and uh, more vivid uh, picture that I've been trying to focus on in my mind's eye. And um, I also will pause sometimes when there's a lot of destruction going on and just pet the cat. And when you think about the Abhidharma, you think about the different senses and how you work with your consciousness while using different senses. So after a while, if you've been using your visual sense for a while to use a tactile sense is a real contrast. So it really kind of gives you an idea to identify where your mind is working uh, with your consciousness, you know, where your body is working with your consciousness. That's kind of cool. And my mom always gets up and needs coffee and a pill. So as soon as I hear her get up, I turn my uh, timer off and go out and get her settled with the newspaper and um, give her coffee and then go back and meditate. And I always have a more vivid picture even after that. So some reason the interruptions help the visualization for a meditation. And I, that's my hack. <laughs> it, it's, it's positive. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. I think it doesn't have, there, there's no one right way. And I think this is where um, having a teacher can be really important because, um, you know, for for a long time, Lama was instructing me to, to have compassion basically for the process and what I was able to do and what I was not able to do. And only recently did I graduate to 12 minutes. <laughs> instead of six minutes he's like okay now you're now you're ready for 12 minutes I'm like whoa this is scary but but you know there's a time for this like you know um there's a time for compassion and doing the things that you need to do and there's also a time to push yourself um but if you're the type of person who struggles with pushing yourself too hard then maybe you need to work on the compassionate part, you know, so each person, you know, may, may have different needs and how to direct their practice, you know, and in your case, you know, having, you know, that compassionate outpouring towards your mother or towards your animals interspersed in that meditation is, is really beautiful. That's very cool. Anybody else have a hack? I'm interested to hear uh, from the Mormons in the audience if they're still present. Any uh, hacks from for your from your tradition of how you keep your um, faith like at your top of mind? And Daniel, are you still here? Or Margo? Margo, still how here. You? How do you keep your faith? Margo's my stepmother. Daniel's my brother. Hi, hi, First off, I'll say you this know, has been. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Daniel. You 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 go first. So I guess first off, I have to say it's been very interesting listening as as everyone has shared their various experiences, because of the fact that I see so many similarities and the the importance of things of not forcing yourself into a pattern and saying this is the one and only right way. And I have to follow this rote way of, of doing X, Y, Z. Otherwise, I'm not doing it right. I, that, I think, is a, an important lesson that I've had to learn as well, that there is openness to be able to, that the right thing might be different at different stages of your life, and that At some points, you know, I need to do X, Y, Z, and that is actually, this rote bit is important for me right now. But that there are other times when, you know, that's not going to be the most appropriate. At the moment, the, the thing that keeps uh, myself and then also my wife and our family focused on, on spiritual things and keeping us, keeping us aligned really becomes just an evening practice. We've set up a thing of, you know, we have these certain things we do before bed. And ideally that's happening and we're going to bed at the same time. But sometimes it's a, uh, one of our, one of us will be up working much later than the other. And so taking that time to say, all right, we're going to have this practice that we do for a while. 
and we're going to take a couple minutes out of our day and do this. Um, but yes, that's that's what comes to mind, and I have to say I've, I've really appreciated seeing and hearing all of the commonalities of, of experience here. This has been very enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And I want to uh, basically echo the same thing is it's, it's very interesting. Autumn, I, of course, I've had uh, children of my own <laughs> and had the same, uh, the same feelings of being overwhelmed and how do I find the time? And I'm going to have to say that even though everyone's grown up, I still have the same, I still have the same problem of when do I have time? I started keeping track of how much time I spent at work and realized I'm putting 70 hours or more in a week, plus taking care of family, plus the cats and, and, and the chickens and the cows and the everything else. But I think it's, um, I can see the progression you have made. I mean, you, you've just come, um, so far in, in the years that, you know, since you've had Kaya, um, you, you're becoming yourself and it is hard. It's hard to stop and say, I'm important, but I think that's something that I learned, um, kind of the hard way and way too late in life. I think you're learning it a lot earlier than I did. Um, and I, I, I love hearing what you and the other people that have been commenting have been saying, because it is, it is so similar to what we believe and what we practice as well. You know, for our, for me, finding time for spirituality means I have to make a decision. I have, I have had to decide that it is the single most important part of my day. Um, and a lot of times I can force myself to get up early enough and spend that time in, you know, we call it in prayer and, and study and, um, thinking. And then, so the one thing that I've done in my life that was just for me was my horses. I mean, that was it. That was, that was the first time I had done anything at all that was just for me. Well, my horse is no, I no longer can have a horse. But two months ago, I brought home two pigeons. <laughs> and those pigeons, and I know it sounds, it sounds silly, but those pigeons are for me. When I sit down in the coop, now that dad has built me a coop that I can, you know, I can put the chickens where I can, or the pigeons where I can actually sit down with them. When I'm sitting with them and I just contemplate nothing but the pigeons and me and the world around it gives me um i can't i can't think of the sorry i have to help my mom take cookies out of the oven um it gives me a reset i think a reset to my day a reset to my feelings um i can go and let the children, the mother, the, the everything go and just reset my spirit and myself. So I think we all, as Daniel said, we all have to find, that, Mom? we all have to find what works for us at this moment. Pigeons. Pigeons. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's different answers for different people. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And then also, oh, one other random thing I was thinking on the, the hackish um, mentality of the life hack idea. My thing has really been, I found a couple of podcasts that are more spiritual in nature for me. I tend to bike ride every morning and that has become my my standard way to start the morning off right is a bit of exercise and then listening to something that's not just interesting but uplifting and i found that to be very valuable nice yeah very cool yeah and i guess i'd say it's something too i mean and 
ditto what everybody has said, uh, not just our family, but the rest of you, your experiences and that. It's, uh, I'm glad I've been here. Thank you for the invitation, Robin. You're welcome. Uh, you know, and you know, the value of, of traditions, and I, you know, I, though I don't totally understand them for sure, but I, I can see that you've got you know, that there's traditions in the, in the Buddhist way of, you know, doing things. And so with us, you know, one of the things would be, uh, what I, we call it the sacrament or other churches might call it communion and that, but every week, uh, it's specifically to do in remembrance, you know, of Jesus. And so I find that to be something that, uh, is kind of grounding, uh, to do on a, Ritual. Yeah, yeah. Ritual. Yes. Yeah. So, anyway. We've got a lot of common ground. The, all these different faiths have a lot of common, you know. I love that. Yeah. Um, Connor, do, are we running out of time or are we? Uh, <laughs> what, what, one, other, one other thing I just got to say oh, here. Right. So go ahead. Second, I, I, I'm a huge Coldplay flat fan. Uh, I love their music. But, uh, there's a song called "Up and Up." Uh, but uh, the second verse, if I can remember, it says, uh, well, "Listen to the news as a guidebook to the blues." Uh, and then he goes on and says, "But we all," basically, he says, "We all see it's the very same steeple." basically that we're all trying to choose, you know, something like that. You just look it up. It's in the second verse. <laughs> I have a song up and up, but I do see a lot of similarities. Yeah. With all of us and wanting the same things. Definitely. I'll be quiet now. And I do think also it brings up a good point. He's, uh, my dad's really into music. He's very musical. He writes music and, and, uh, listens to music and for myself i'm an artist and one of the things uh that religious traditions bring in that is very helpful is uh you know the arts or whatever makes sense to you i know we have some literary folks in our in our midst as well so lama's always bringing in um either visuals for the visual people or uh, songs for the musical people or um, literary stories for those those folks, you know, find, finding those things that really resonate with you. For me, it's the visuals. I, a beautiful picture that has a lot of meaning can can help me. So, yeah. Well, I hope this has been helpful for people and in some way. Uh, but I appreciate you guys listening to me and getting to know a few of my uh family and friends that have joined today and thank you for being here yeah. thank you autumn um it, the timing's really up to you so if, if you want to call it we can call it oh yeah okay unless someone else has any i i wasn't sure i should have asked you what time ahead of time no i'm okay. good okay <laughs> all right yeah <laughs> um so i'm gonna ask you if there's any announcements no? When are we okay. going back to the temple? Do we know? Um, so that's a work in progress right now. So I don't have a definite answer to that. Um, Lama does want to try to have a Buddha Dharma program on Monday in person. So look for an email about that. Um, you know, we do have limited seating and stuff. So hopefully there'll be an email tomorrow morning um, as early as I possibly can get it out once I have some more details about that. Um, and then a couple other things, uh, Thursday evening, this coming Thursday on the 12th, Kongshu Rinpoche is going to be, uh, speaking again for Buddha Dharma study program, but hope to encourage as many of you as possible to attend that. Um, it's a great speaker, great talk on introduction to Tantra, philosophy of Tantra. Um, and then what else is coming up? Uh, tomorrow... I don't know if Patty's still here. Tomorrow we're closing the um, fundraiser for 
guess you say Wong tomorrow, or has that always been closed, Patty? Yes, no, I think it's closing tomorrow. So if you still want to donate to that, you can find the GoFundMe um, uh, on Facebook. I just want to Patty, is that still open or is it already closed? Um, it is still open until tomorrow. We had it for like one month with GoFundMe and I didn't expect the kind of help that came forward. And I just been so surprised in the best possible way because um, because together we're doing something really good and it's in our world sometimes kind of hard to find those little, those little sparks, you know? So uh, thank you again for helping. It is open. Um, it is open, and if, if anybody listening right now wants to contribute, um, you can contribute di directly to Lions Roar Dharma Center and just put in your memo for uh, Nagari Institute, and, and we'll make sure that Geshe Sewan gets it. Yeah. Um, and then Run to Feed the Hungry is still opened. Um, so, Susan, do you have anything to say about that or any more information about that? Um, just to, uh, that Lion's Roar is a runner, um, uh, in Run to Feed the Hungry, and there was a thing in the paper today that one dollar will buy five meals, and that the, um, food bank, the, the food bank supplies food to a lot of different, uh, places. So it isn't just, you know, this one location. This is for like, you know, all over the place. So it's really, they they feed somewhere, the last numbers I read, um, 250,000 meals, you know, a month. I mean, that's a lot, a lot of people that need food, probably my neighbors and your neighbors and maybe relatives and friends, you know, people we know are relying on the food bank to eat. So, um just get on Run to Feed the Hungry virtual 10K and search for Lions or Dharma Center and you can make a donation there uh, and uh, or join the team as well. Um, and then there's always the LRDC Lions Roar General Fund. Um, we always appreciate donations um, to help support the activities and the programming that we have. Um, and the Sergey Food Fund, um, India has been hit hard, fairly, fairly hard with COVID. They're doing a pretty good job recently. Um, they don't have a second wave yet, um, which is good. But um, you know, monks got to eat to be able to study and work, so that's always helpful. Um, I don't think there's any other announcements that I have. Does anyone else have other announcements? Yeah, Elizabeth. Um. If there's anybody here who is interested in trains and Sacramento history and the history of California, I'm giving a talk on the 19th about the Central Pacific, which is part of the transcontinental train. I'm talking about how the Central Pacific uh, produced and managed the first organized healthcare employer provided healthcare in the United States and how that action shaped how healthcare is delivered in the United States. It's extremely exciting and interesting. This is a time before antibiotics, before trauma care, before anesthesiology, and the railroad, the Central Pacific Railroad, provided healthcare for its employees. More than two million men were employed by railroads across the United States. And in this action, they created their own hospital and managed care plan and promulgated to promulgated it throughout the whole of the United States and began employer-provided benefits. 
So it's an exciting talk, if I say so myself. If you're interested, email me and I'll send you the link. It's online on Zoom. It's during the daytime. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to stick your email in the chat so people can email you in case they're uh, interested or or they can email info at lionsroadharmacenter.org and we can forward that on to you either way, whatever works. All right. If there's no other announcements, we'll do closing prayers. All right. Uh, sorry. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chan Rezig, Tenzin Gatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness. May they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. The verses that save Sakya from sickness, prayer for pacifying the fear of disease. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harm of spirits, illness, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases which, like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever sufferings arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified and may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health, and well being. By the compassion of the Gurus and the Three Jewels, the power of the Dakinis, Dharma protectors, and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results, may these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Omaha. Thanks, Autumn. Thanks, Autumn. Thanks. Thanks, Autumn. I apparently don't know how to mute him. Thank you, Autumn. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you, Autumn. Congratulations. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.